As a company that has been involved with video games since the late 1970s, Nintendo has a long, storied history that could fill several books. As such, the company is liable to have encountered a controversy or two. This is the shady side of Nintendo. While price cuts aren't anything new, the 3DS's excessive drop in price mere months after release had consumers raising their eyebrows. The handheld system initially started at $250, but five months later, it fell to $170, a staggering 32% slash in price. By this point in the console's lifespan, fewer than 900,000 systems have been sold in the United States. Given the lack of sales, the drastic price reduction may have been an attempt to attract reluctant buyers. Expectedly, this major discount following so close to its initial release was met with criticism. Those who bought the 3DS before the price reduction felt cheated. Then Nintendo CEO Satoru Iwata released an apology to these early buyers. In his apology, Iwata acknowledged, never before has Nintendo chosen to issue such a dramatic price drop less than six months after a system release. To make amends, those who bought the 3DS before the price cut were given free Game Boy Advance games through something called the 3DS Ambassador Program, a precursor to the virtual console feature for the 3DS that originally debuted on the Nintendo Wii. Limited digital releases have garnered Nintendo some negative publicity over the years. Though the company dabbled with the concept with the free-to-play title Jump Rope Challenge, the idea of limited runs releases for their games has not been met with enthusiasm. Eventually, Jump Rope Challenge was changed to have a permanent spot on the eShop, but it's not the only game to get the limited time release treatment. Super Mario Bros. 35 adds a competitive spin to the classic title in the vein of Tetris 99. The game is exclusive to the Nintendo Switch Online service, but it's not a permanent fixture. According to the Nintendo Direct's presentation that revealed it, the game is only playable from October 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2021. Perhaps more significantly, Super Mario 3D All-Stars, a collection celebrating the 35th anniversary of Super Mario Bros., will also be delisted from the eShop on March 31st, 2021. Even more shocking is that physical copies of that title will be pulled from physical retail locations on the same date. Limiting sales for these games could be a tactic to bolster subscriptions to Nintendo Switch Online, or perhaps the three games included in the bundle will be resold individually at a higher price point later on. Whatever the reason, limited availability doesn't seem to sit right with Nintendo fans. The Nintendo Entertainment System is home to some of gaming's most beloved titles. From the classic Super Mario Bros. to the original Legend of Zelda, the NES was the first stop on a lifelong journey of gaming for many video game enthusiasts. When Nintendo announced in 2016 that it would be launching a mini version of the NES preloaded with 30 popular titles, the excitement was off the charts. Compounded with the fact that the nostalgic console was selling for only $60, Nintendo fans did an impression of Fry when they yelled in unison, Shut up and take my money! The the problem is, Nintendo didn't seem to want the money, given the lack of NES classics for sale. Stores didn't receive enough units to meet customer demand. The end result was that retailers sold out fast and didn't receive new stock for months, making the console nearly impossible to find without turning to scalpers and the grey market. Then Nintendo president Tatsumi Kimishima released an apology citing production issues for the NES Classic shortages. However, some believe this was an all-intentional design to drive up customer interest in the console. Though the Nintendo Switch has been met with rave reviews across the board, the console's Joy-Con controllers haven't exactly been living up to everyone's expectations. While some players are lucky not to experience any issues at all, a good number of Joy-Cons suffer from what has been deemed Joy-Con Drift. What exactly is Joy-Con Drift? Basically, it's when the Joy-Con thinks that you've input a command when you haven't at all. This can result in minor annoyances like cameras acting wonky for a few seconds. It can also have more drastic effects as well, like sending characters aimlessly running in one direction. This can make some games virtually unplayable. Though Switch owners have the option of sending their janky Joy-Cons in for repair, they have to pay a shipping cost to do so. A fix also doesn't guarantee the same issue won't resurface again later on. Nintendo was dealt a class action lawsuit in July 2019 as a result of this Joy-Con flaw, and Nintendo president Shuntaro Furukawa offered affected Switch owners an apology a year later. For content creators, navigating copyright law is already a tricky affair. Throw in the added stress of Nintendo's aggressive restrictions on the usage of its properties, and it's enough to make most people shy away from streaming or making Nintendo-focused content. One of the most egregious examples of Nintendo's lack of leniency in this area is a controversial Nintendo Creators program. Though the program was promoted as a way for YouTubers to advertise on videos featuring Nintendo content, they took portions of the profits made from channels and videos registered in the program 
program. The registration process could also take up to three days, which could be disadvantageous to reviewers and those posting on deadlines. Of course, the program only further strained the relationship between Nintendo and YouTubers. In the end, the Nintendo Creators program was shut down. Streamers were finally able to profit from content like Let's Plays or live streams without Nintendo stepping in to take a cut. Amiibo were a brilliant marketing opportunity for Nintendo. Fans could buy figurines of their favorite characters like Pikachu, Mario, Samus, or even Wii Fit Trainer, and scan them into their Wii U or 3DS to add extra content and select games. For those new to the world of Amiibo collecting, it may be hard to believe that these simple toys were the source of so much stress and heartache for so many fans. Once the first wave of the Amiibo shipped to stores, there was an apparent lack of availability for three specific figures in the lineup. Marth, Wii Fit Trainer, and Villager. The second-hand market went wild. Scalpers were selling rare amiibo well above the $12.99 market price, and the trend would only continue as new figurines were released and resold at outrageous prices on sites like eBay. It was a feeding frenzy. No. A year after the initial launch, Nintendo released a statement apologizing for the production shortages. Eventually, the once impossibly rare amiibo were re-released, but memories of the amiibo craze were not soon forgotten. Xbox Live has existed since Microsoft's original Xbox. PlayStation Plus debuted on the PlayStation 3 in 2011. With these two services available to gamers, it only seemed like a matter of time until Nintendo offered something similar. That comparable online service came in the form of Nintendo Switch Online. However, once details of the service were revealed in a Nintendo Direct, consumers openly questioned whether $20 a year was worth it for a small library of NES titles, limited cloud saves, and an external phone application for voice chat. Nintendo later added free-to-play titles such as Tetris 99 and Super Mario Bros. 35 to the service, which helped boost its value. It has also continued to support its free classic games offerings, greatly expanding the library of NES games available to play and adding support for SNES games as well. Additionally, though still not great, the phone app used for voice chat has expanded to include features for games like Splatoon 2, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, and Animal Crossing New Horizons. Years later, however, Nintendo Switch Online still doesn't provide a great online multiplayer experience, and lacks the free monthly games Xbox Live and PlayStation Plus subscribers have grown accustomed to. Many of the greatest stories are about epic quests for revenge. John Wick and Kill Bill come to mind as prime examples. The video game world has had its own tale of vengeance that rocked its foundations. It's a story that involves both Nintendo and Sony, two companies that are still major players in the industry to this day. The drama unfolded at the June 1991 Consumer Electronics Show, when Nintendo was set to unveil a partnership with Sony and Philips to make a disc-based add-on for its SNES console. However, when the time came for the announcement, Nintendo revealed that it would be working solely with Philips on the new project. This surprised just about everyone at CES, including Sony. In retaliation, Sony decided that if Nintendo would go back on the deal it made, it would beat Nintendo at its own game. Sony bided its time and transformed the disc-based console it had worked on with Nintendo into its own killer console. The rest is PlayStation history. In April 2016, Nintendo fired Allison Rapp, who worked in marketing for Nintendo's Treehouse team. Her dismissal followed a month-long campaign from trolls and participants in Gamergate to make her life miserable. Her detractors have been both harassing rap personally and reaching out to Nintendo with numerous complaints. Why were people rallying to get this member of Nintendo's marketing team fired? Rap had used her sizable online following to talk about feminism and adjacent social justice issues, a common precursor for women facing Gamergate ire. In a statement, Nintendo claimed that Rap was fired for holding a second job that clashed with Nintendo's values, and that her termination had nothing to do with the vocal minority of trolls that seemed to hate her. However, Rap was dubious of the company's claims and said on Twitter, do you think that if the industry wasn't afraid of women, sex positivity, etc., that the anonymous moonlighting I did would have been a problem? Many were quick to criticize the company, describing Nintendo's actions as callous, among other things. In the 90s, violence in video games was a large part of the public discourse in the United States. 
The thought of pixelated guts and gore corrupting America's youth ultimately led to the congressional hearings on video game violence, which took place in 1993. The controversy was largely centered around Mortal Kombat, which came under the microscope after a rise of real-life violence occurred during the height of the game's popularity. As a result, Mortal Kombat and video games as a whole became the scapegoat for an undercurrent of violence that had supposedly gripped American youth. At the hearings, Nintendo chairman Howard Lincoln seized an opportunity to draw heat away from his company at the expense of Nintendo's biggest competitor, Sega. He specifically cited Mortal Kombat and Nintendo's efforts to censor the original's bloodiest elements in the Super Nintendo version of the game. This was clearly a shot at Sega, which did not censor Mortal Kombat on the Sega Genesis. <laughs> Lincoln went even further, painting Sega's controversial game Night Trap as particularly dangerous to children while stating the title would never be on a Nintendo system. Ironically, years later, Night Trap launched with little controversy on the Nintendo Switch. The Wii mostly targeted casual gamers, and for that reason, it played host to a lot of party games. Some might argue, however, that the console responsible for making these games popular was a Nintendo 64. Mario Party was the title that put the party game genre on the map, kicking off a long-running franchise that still gets new entries. However, Mario Party on the N64 also injured quite a few of Nintendo's fans. Mario Party's minigames had very simplistic control schemes, sometimes using just a handful of buttons. A few games tasked players with quickly rotating the control stick to win the match. To accomplish this, many players place their palms over the control stick and move their hands in a circular motion. Unfortunately, some who employed this tactic wound up with injuries to their palms. Once enough players and concerned parents complained, Nintendo was taken to court by the Attorney General of New York. <laughs> As a remedy, Nintendo settled out of court, paid the attorney fees for the state of New York, and promised over $80 million to provide padded gloves that affected families could claim. Nintendo learned its lesson, though, and games that required players to rotate the stick disappeared from Mario Party for over a decade after that point. Nintendo wasn't always a titan of the video game industry. In fact, the company had a rather humble beginning. Starting in 1889 as a toy company, Nintendo decided to begin producing video games in the late 1970s. Despite being a well-established company before working on video games, Nintendo partnered with the engineering firm Ikegami Sashinki to manufacture the hardware for its initial arcade titles. However, Nintendo had difficulty breaking into the American arcade market with Radar Scope, only selling one-third of its stock. So it pivoted. The remaining cabinets intended for Radar Scope were instead remade into the company's first big hit, Donkey Kong, which had been made by both Nintendo and Ikegami Sashinki. Nintendo Shigeru Miyamoto designed the game, but Ikegami Sashinki employees were the ones who ended up coding it. Donkey Kong was such a runaway success that Nintendo decided to violate its agreement with Ikegami Sashinki. The company created 80,000 arcade boards of its own after buying only 8,000 from Ikegami Sashinki, which was supposed to be its partner. To make matters worse, Nintendo decided to leave the developer in the dust when it came time to work on Donkey Kong's follow-up, Donkey Kong Jr. The company hired a subcontractor to reverse engineer Donkey Kong's code for use in the new game, thereby completely cutting its former partner out of the process. Ikegami Sashinki was understandably peeved at Nintendo's sequel and sued the gaming giant for infringing on its copyright for Donkey Kong. The courts recognized that the code in Donkey Kong Jr. belonged to Ikegami Sashinki, but the two companies decided to settle out of court before the legal battle went any further. Over the years, Nintendo has relied on actors in costumes to promote its games. And fortunately, one character has caused real problems for the actors who have played him, causing multiple people who have done the costume to sue Nintendo for alleged mistreatment. Which character has caused so much grief, you ask? Donkey Kong. Parker Mills sued Nintendo in 2014 after working an event at the Los Angeles Zoo. Mills was asked to wear a Donkey Kong costume at the event to celebrate the release of Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D. Mills' attorney said that his client was denied breaks and was not given the ice pack he required to stay cool in the suit. Mills ended up tearing his aorta walls and also required surgery to implant a defibrillator due to physical stress. Michael O'Connor Trio, meanwhile, sued Nintendo in 2016 after performing as Donkey Kong in a Culver City CA Mall. Okoni Trio claimed that he was required by Nintendo to wear a Donkey Kong costume, which he said was, quote, poorly ventilated and unreasonably and dangerously hot. 
Oconee Trio blamed the suit for causing permanent damage as well as mental and emotional distress. The lesson here is, if you ever work for Nintendo, don't wear the Donkey Kong suit. Nintendo is known for selling older games on newer hardware, which can cause some fans to buy the same title over and over, generation after generation. Nintendo kept this tradition alive on the Wii with the Virtual Console. The Wii Virtual Console was an emulator, enabling players to purchase and play games from a number of past Nintendo consoles. Of course, Nintendo couldn't help but include its best-selling game from any system prior, Super Mario Bros. Customers who bought Super Mario Bros. for the Wii Virtual Console were greeted with a fairly standard version of the classic title. However, further inspection of the files by Eurogamer revealed the game had portions of code that were similar to Super Mario Bros. ROMs shared online. ROMs are copies of a video game's code that can be run on an emulator. Eurogamer turned the game files over to Mara Fagelin, the creator of the INES emulator, for further inspection. Fagelin confirmed that the Super Mario Bros. files used by the Wii Virtual Console were virtually identical to the ones found in other pirated copies online. When pressed about the similarities between the Virtual console version of Super Mario Bros. and the legal copies posted online, Nintendo chose not to comment. This led some to speculate that Nintendo was indeed selling customers a file downloaded from the internet. In 1989, Nintendo's legal department decided it had a bone to pick with the movie rental store Blockbuster. Nintendo claimed that the rental giant was repeatedly violating its intellectual property rights when renting out Nintendo games. The issue wasn't that Blockbuster was making money by renting those titles out to customers, which is what you might assume. Instead, the House of Mario was unhappy about a totally different thing Blockbuster was doing to help those renting video games from its stores. Nintendo took Blockbuster to court after discovering the rental chain was routinely copying its game instruction booklets. Blockbuster wanted to make sure people could play the games they paid for, so it included copies of instruction manuals along with rentals as a courtesy. Nintendo and Blockbuster eventually settled the matter out of court, with Blockbuster promising to cease its copying of Nintendo's manuals. Blockbuster instead started including third-party instruction booklets, ensuring players still had the information they needed to enjoy their rentals. Sometimes you're playing a game and there's an obstacle that you just can't get past. Whether it's a challenging platform stage or a particularly tough boss, repeated failure can quickly become frustrating. After so many failed attempts, you might look for cheat codes, or perhaps search for a way to cheese the game. Back in the 8-bit era, some companies began marketing new products that could create cheats for games. Even if those games didn't have cheat codes, these devices manipulated a game's code to enable things like invincibility or extra lives. Nintendo didn't like the notion of other companies making a profit by modifying the intended functionality of its games. As a result, Nintendo took Galoob, the maker of the infamous Game Genie, to court in 1990. It argued that the Game Genie violated its copyrights by creating derivative works. However, since the Game Genie couldn't change a game's code unless it was attached to the cartridge itself, the courts sided against Nintendo. This enabled the Game Genie and products like it to continue being sold to gamers around the world. You can bet Nintendo is thankful these devices aren't as popular today as they once were. Nintendo made headlines in late 2020 after YouTuber Captain Alex ran a successful Indiegogo campaign to sell themed Joy-Con shells to raise money for charity. The shells were designed in honor of YouTuber Etika, and the proceeds were meant to go to the non-profit JED Foundation. Despite the campaign's good intentions, a cease and desist letter was sent to Captain Alex by Nintendo over the use of the word Joy-Cons and the use of the Switch logo. Speaking to The Independent, Captain Alex clarified that the letter also referenced other violations that had to do with the use of Nintendo's logos on products he was selling in his Etsy store. Despite his frustrations with the situation, Captain Alex recognized that he'd infringed on Nintendo's copyrights. Still, Nintendo's targeting of small creators hasn't gone unnoticed, and the entire situation has stirred a fair amount of negative sentiment regarding how Nintendo seems to value its fans. The Big House, a popular Super Smash Bros. tournament that goes back to 2011, had its 2020 tournament shut down by Nintendo's legal team. Because of the coronavirus pandemic, the tournament had arranged for participants to use an emulated copy of Super Smash Bros. Melee, running a mod called Slippy, which allows for online play. But Nintendo, a longtime partner of the competition, set an ultimatum for the Big House, disallow the use of the mod, or face legal consequences. In the end, the Big House insisted on using Slippy, so Nintendo issued a cease and desist letter for the whole 2020 event. This wasn't a popular move in the larger Smash community's eyes leading to hashtag Free Melee trending on Twitter and to notable players in the Smash scene berating Nintendo for taking away a rare chance competitors had to compete during a pandemic. 